I think we're on. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Claire German and I'm the Managing Director of Design Centre Chelsea Harbour. Welcome to the second episode of Design Date, Design Collaborations on Craft and Creativity, which we have partnered today with the World of Interiors. We are simply delighted to um, welcome the renowned designer Laurie Weitzner and Michael Cohen, President of Samuel and Sons, who are joining us for a truly transatlantic session. There will be so much to talk about, craft, innovation, and of course, the beauty of Pesmontry. So there might not be time for questions and answers. Anyway, I'm handing you over to the capable, safe hands of Sophie Salomon, who's the executive editor of the World of Interiors, who is chairing the session today. Sophie, over to you, and thank you so much for everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Claire. I just want to welcome our two guests all the way from New York. We've got Michael Cohen, as Claire said, from who's president of Samuel and Sons. Laurie Weitzner, who's the creative director and principal of Laurie Weitzner Design. Thanks, guys, for joining. Um, and we're here to talk about your collaborative partnership, which I believe has been going on for 14 years, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Laurie, you have the dates. Yes, I, I, it's soon to be our 15th anniversary. I'm waiting for a gift. Wow, that's quite a, <laughs> an achievement. going to be another but, collection. So Michael, <laughs> you, you joined Samuel and Sons in 1998. And let's talk a little bit about the world of Passamontree at that time, did you feel that there was a need to create something new and something refreshing? Was there a kind of a demand for it? So it, you have to understand a little bit the context of me when I joined the business. Mm -hmm. um, in 1998, I was just a couple of years, um, it was actually 99 probably when I was a couple of years removed from uh, university. I'd spent two years in finance and I was, uh, I had spent my childhood growing up in the trimming business. I'm third generation in the business now. Um, the original business was uh, named M&J Trimming, actually still exists, uh, geared primarily towards fashion and crafts. And um, at that point as a child, I, I have to admit, I didn't have an appreciation for what was happening and what uh, the popularity of trimming for fashion at that time. And I remember crowds of people um, clamoring to get into M&J those days. And I actually swore to myself that I wouldn't join the trimming business at that point because um, I just, I didn't get it. And I went into finance. I spent a couple of years um, doing that. And my father had opened the uh, Samuel and Son showroom by the design center and expanded into interior trimming. So at that point, when I joined the business, I, um, I really didn't, I didn't, know as much. I didn't come in thinking I know. I didn't know in terms of design and what they needed in terms. I was really listening and learning from our customers. And the one thing I did see is that definitely there were still clients buying a lot of traditional elements as they are still today, more so back then. But we had designers asking us for and really uh, had a new level of appreciation for simpler, cleaner details, um, specifically in the borders and the pipings here in the U.S., and um, that's the way we started to develop. Also at that time, we didn't have a design studio. So we were editing from um, European manufacturers who were creating collections and we were, we were picking the colors that we thought were suitable for the US markets, the styles that we thought were suitable for the US market. And um, like the one thing that I will say that there was a culture though of innovation with my father who was at that point had taken something like um, seashells that he had seen on a, um, a, a placemat. I hope that's a British term, but. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and he had contacted the manufacturer and had it converted into a fringe. So that was, I think, you know, something that was really oh, wow. exciting. So you can see there you have the seashells and, you know, that type of innovation was something that was not as frequent, but it was happening. Um, then, but my, my dad was essentially the creative director at that point. And tell me about how you guys, how it came about that you guys started working together, where it all began. I think we're going to see an image now of the four of you together. Um, but yeah, talk, talk, tell us a little bit about that, about where it all started. So that's my, uh, that's my dad and my brother, Joseph. Um, of course, myself and Lori, um, my brother Jaime is also uh, a very integral part of the business, happens not to be in that, that image. But um, in L.A., it was around 2005, I guess, right, Lori? 
we had we had um we had just um gotten representation on the west coast at needle for share for share and Lori was presenting her new collection of sako and i was, was sitting there with my dad we were just excited to be at la market i don't think we've ever been there before um so that was a fun trip for us and my dad turns to me and he says you know imagine we could have someone like that designing passementry and um and then you know Lori finished <laughs> And then, Laura, you could take it from there. And Laurie, is, that, is that how it went? Well, yes, I, I finished my presentation and then I sat on the sofa to watch the passamentary presentation that Sasha, their head of sales, gave. And I'm thinking, wow, I didn't even know what passamentary was, to be very honest. But now I do. And this stuff's cool. It's like jewelry for the home. And then next to me on the sofa was Sam, Michael's dad. And he just leaned over and he said, hey, have you ever thought about designing passamentary? That's and I dad. kind of looked at him and I said, um, I write, then? <laughs> and it was it. And then I literally like got home from California and wrote that I typed them a letter that I smailed in the mail <laughs> and asked if we could meet so like we could talk about a collaboration. And, and that was the beginning and I will never forget it. And it was for me, like my juices were flowing because I had no experience obviously doing that, but I was, my roots are a textile designer. So it was really interesting. And it was a what very pivotal, sorry. sorry. It was a very pivotal point for the company to, to bring on, not only in this case, it was a license, but just to have a designer designing product for us instead of editing and just picking things that were really made for the European market specifically. So it was um, something new for you guys to work with a designer, um, kind of a new venture. Yeah, I think I think it was it was maybe the yeah. very first time we may have had a consultant at some point, but you know this was um, a new level of detail that we were doing it. I mean, one of the also the interesting things is because Lori had never designed passementry, she had come to us and said, "Okay, well now teach me, teach me a little bit about it. How do you know what do I do? What are the rules?" And I think one of the keys to our success has been we said, "You know what? Why don't you imagine it?" And then we can try to figure out how to make it. And right, that's- That was so smart of them. It's most smart, so smart of you. And I know that collaborations work in different ways, but the idea of starting without limitations, you can always cut back when you can't do something or find a way to do it. But if you already start with limitations, you're not gonna get the best possible creation, I think. So that was really smart of them. And we did have to like figure out how to do a few things and it did take a while, but it was so worth it. So this was a new, so Passamont, the world of Passamonte was something that was quite, I mean, I'm sure you were familiar with it, but it was the first time for you to design, design it, so to speak. Yeah. And I had been as a textile designer to many mills, but I had never been to a passamentary mill, which is different. The looms are different. And the, also there are a lot of things to learn. Like when I design a fabric, that's the main story on a sofa. Um, so all of a sudden thinking about trim, trim is the detail. Trim is that special detail to enhance or enrich the fabric. So it's, it's almost the supporting cast as opposed to the main story. And how do you design it so that it can be easy for designers to work with and use in a lot of ways? One of the first things Michael taught me was the more colors in a, in a piece, the more easily it's used in many different scenarios. So it's just like little things like that and bigger things. Um, <clears throat> so it was and, really fun. And so you talk about Passamontre being this kind of age old art. It has a lot of heritage around it. And were you kind of familiar with all the, not all of them, but some of the arts and crafts and the techniques that were involved in, that were kind of associated with it? Well, after that first meeting, <laughs> I got very knowledgeable quite quickly, just trying to understand as much as I could. Um, and there's a grand history to it, but my thoughts about it were always very, very traditional. And my clients were not necessarily using passamentary in those days. So the goal was how to design passamentary for the designers or for the clients who would normally maybe not use the traditional passamentary. Right. And how do you bridge it? Yeah. And right. um, so some, I think some of the techniques that you've talked about previously were kind of a pleating technique that you used. I think we're going to see some pictures of that now. 
Um, and was this a kind of a, an old technique that is that you that kind of inspired you, or tell us a little so, bit about how you how you found it? Bleeding has been used for centuries, and um, I've used them so much in both wall covering and fabric. The idea to use it in a trim. Um, was new at the time, very new. Now I think more people have it, but we started out with a collection and um, I remember bringing it to Michael, <laughs> is it all right to say that? They loved it, but they thought, oh no, no, this isn't gonna sell, And but we'll try it, let's give it a go, which is what was amazing about them. And it was so successful because it was dimensional and it was a different way of, of um, showing a detail on a sofa or in a piece of furniture. So as you can see here, like we're using different materials. So pleating is an age old, I mean, it's ancient how we do it. And you can do it different ways. You can do it with heat and you can do it with sewing. So we had to have to figure out how to slice, splice them if we were doing it by heat and back them. And there was a lot to it. And then we had to figure out what the fabrics were going to look like and what the colors were gonna look like. And at this point now, many years later, we have many styles in the collection. Michael allowed me to do what's called encore, which is kind of a, re, a, a, a new version of pleating that we just, I forget when we launched that's that. That's it there, yeah. And that's, that's that. So is that we, what we're looking at now? Yeah. That's lovely. We're always pushing further, pushing, how far yeah. can you go with pleating? Oh, there it is. <laughs> and so these kind of techniques were, I guess, incorporated into the collection as in they were used but they will, you also kind of drew inspiration from them too. Is that right? Yeah, and this one on the screen is an example of a combination of a stitched pleat and an embroidery. So embroidery is a really ancient technique as well, stitched into this, into this pleated pattern. So it's also, how else can we do pleating in a way that hasn't quite been done before? It's, it's really, be, and the colors are really lovely too. Um, and tell us a little bit about, um, Michael, you mentioned kind of seashells, but um, tell us a little bit about new materials that you used as well. I think we've got some images of some beading oh, coming so up. I, I th yeah, I think, well, I think integral to, uh, here's, here's a, um, I mean, this was, I think, our very first, one of our very first products we did with Lori. Um, in this case, even the beads, I think at the, my father's M&J days really helped because we used beads that didn't tarnish. But um, you know, using new materials and new crafts were such a big part of our partnership with Lori and have become a big part of who Samuel & Sons is today and its, its culture of innovation. Um, you know, before then, I think it was, it was much simpler. We would basically go to trimming. We, would, we would partner with our trimming manufacturers. The trimming manufacturers basically know how to do tassel fringe, bullion fringe, you know, cords, tie backs, borders, that's it. But if you, if you ask them to do beads, they don't have beads. They don't know how to put them on. They, they don't have the resource for it. And so um, we, we challenge them. I, I think on the material side, in some cases, we challenged our traditional manufacturers to source Things. We found things local in the market. I know, Lori, we did a collection with uh, semi-precious stones. We right. knew in the market there was a lot of uh, jade was very plentiful and rose quartz was very plentiful. And so when we challenged our manufacturer to do it, they were able, they were able to source it and find it. And it was a very exciting collection. So even the hand-blown glass. I mean, I think we were both surprised. Lori brought a hand-blown glass bead. She had shopped in the market. She brought a hand-blown glass bead. From Iran, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, she's out here. I mean, this is... I don't know if you could see that here, but oh, yeah, that's lovely, beautiful, so, exquisite. Says, yeah, can can we do that? And I was like, no, no, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> so I, um, but I said, all right, let's give it a shot. So I sent it off. I sent a challenge, and and within a few weeks, we got several samples. Like, wow, this this can happen. Um, so using uh, new materials, challenging our partners, in some cases going out and looking outside of our partners, right, oh. was uh, such a key part of um, what we've done. And Lori really, I, I really think when I think back on it, it was so key that we didn't give her limitations. She thinks about passimetry in a very novel, different way. She does no preconceptions on it, which we which we really, I think, use to our partnership's advantage. 
right? It could have been such a disadvantage. And yet we had the expertise on the function and Lori had the vision. Yeah. Creativity to come up with these new. And a kind of a fresh outlook, I guess. Not fresh, but kind of, I guess, because it was a new world for you. It was for Lori. I promise you, Sophie, before I met Lori, I would have, I may have said a thousand times to people, I said, pass some entry, everything's already been done already. The only thing that's changing is we're changing the color, we're tweaking, we're tweaking the design on the top, where it's all been done. If you look back centuries, you see such creativity, colors that you wouldn't imagine existed. Um, you know, I'm sure you see it in textiles as well, and in trimming even more so because you had the ability to, it's, it's such a um, intensive handcraft when you yeah. get into tassels and covered beads that there was a period of time when I joined the business, you couldn't have a covered bead because the cost would be so extraordinary. So we would work with our partner in France and um, they actually had, on the cover of their catalog, they would have this beautiful ornate tassel with jasmines and flowers and covered beads and so forth. And I said, you know, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Let's just make it. And he was, he'd say, we, but we can't. It, it would, you, we can't even make it. It would be too expensive, too difficult, too hard. Um, and that actually has changed in recent, recent years with, um, with bringing different craftspeople, different countries that we're working with. Um, there's been a lot of innovation, both on the material side and on, on the crafts. And we could talk about all the different craftspeople we've brought into the industry, into the trimming industry, which really... Again, we were looking at trimming manufacturers. Up until that time, it was always about trimming manufacturers. Then we started to work with craftspeople who were able then to, we were able to teach them how to use their craft and apply it towards trim. So, and that's what you, you'll start to see with the pleating, for instance, which is an age old technique, but no yeah. trimming manufacturer had any ability to, to make it. They didn't know where to start, but a pleater did. And we just had to teach them how to convert it into a border. And so was it a kind of a challenge for you guys to find new cross people to work with for each technique that you found and to, to find new artisans to work with as well? I guess it was finding the people who were able to do, because as you say, Michael, they were new techniques that had not been done before. So I, I would say two things. I would say, first of all, Lori was integral in introducing us to, to in some cases because she had worked on in the textiles for instance, on, on pleated fabrics. So um, I would say the other thing that continues to be somewhat of a challenge, but I think now that trimming is becoming, a, is enjoying a little bit of a renaissance and popularity and we're able to showcase what we've already done, this has become easier. But the biggest challenge we had at that time was convincing a, tri a, a craftsman that it was worthwhile to invest the time and in some cases, the technology to convert their craft into trimming, right? They, they weren't interested. Fabric was, yeah. fabric, for instance, would be much more worthwhile. If, I, if I'm an embroiderer and I'm doing all this fabric, do I, do I want to spend, how much time do I want to spend on, on a border? So that was also a challenge um, that, that we faced. But we, and, and it's, we continue to look for different crafts that we can utilize. And we, we kind of live in a world now that seemingly seems to change every day with new technologies emerging and new amazing way of, ways of doing things. And is that quite important for you guys to, to work with these new methods while still maintaining the heritage techniques to kind of combine the two? Do you have any examples of, of pieces that can show this, that can demonstrate this as well? Yeah, we do have some images I think we're going to show, but also I just, the old and the new marrying together is sort of this pervasive theme throughout everything we're doing, whether it's mixing old and new techniques, whether it's working with the handmade artisan communities, which Michael just touched upon, and I just want to re-emphasize how important and integral that's been to our products. And these can't, a lot of these can't be machine done in a big factory. These are done by artisans with care, with love, with attention, um, handmade, where you can only make a certain amount of yardage a day, and yet they have to produce consistent um, product that over time can perform well for our clients. And I'm so excited that that continues to grow that part of our business. You saw some images with the hand needlework and all, because those techniques will go away if 
we don't support them. Absolutely, there's no demand. There needs to be the demand for it too. Yeah. yeah. So the biggest um, thrill is, sorry, the biggest thrill is when you see this handmade product, but then you see it like in this, um, you know, the Four Seasons Hotel. Yeah. Like that is this translation that works. Uh, Lori, I was putting up, this is the French knots that right. you've done for the Astro Border in such yeah. a, such a age old technique, right? In such a contemporary yeah. pattern. Perfect example. Yeah, absolutely. And Perfect example. It's a contemporary pattern. We have a lot of contemporary designers using it people who wouldn't normally, but the, tradi the the technique of that knot is so old. I don't know how old, but really old. Like, oh my gosh, I can only imagine. And, and tell us, I think we're gonna see some images from the outdoor collection too. Um, right. So tell us a little bit about that. So that's a new way that, pe not a new way, but um, using trim outdoors is, I guess, there's more demand for it now. Yeah, there's more demand for using it outdoor. And also it seems that a lot of people wanna use some of it indoor, depending on the type of space it is that has high traffic or, or dining area. But um, here's where old and new mix in a little bit of a different way where the newness is the yarn, that it's a completely waterproof, mold proof, fade resistant, all of that. Um, and so you can pour anything on it. It's also bleach cleanable. So if you spill anything, you can bleach clean it. So do you work with a fiber like that is pretty interesting and then to do it with in the case of this outdoor collection we we stuck to more um classic patterning but we ombre and so this is an example of ombre i love to ombre work and that means where you shift color you can either shift one colorway dark to light or light to dark so or it's gradual. is that so it's kind of a little yep. gradual yeah. Yes. So it's a gradual or you shift from color world to color world in a gradual way. This is another example of our where we ombre this fun tassel fringe. So um, I use that a lot. I used it with the outdoor collection and use it with this so that it, it's there's a freshness to it, not just on the material side, but on the color, the way we color approach it. And it's amazing as you talk about these kind of, you know, when we talk about new technologies, that's, that also means using new materials such as these, like these threads that are kind of, as Laurie, you just said, that are kind of suitable for outdoors and um, highly resist, highly durable and highly um, resistant as well. So, And again, bleach cleanable, I'll say again, because it seems like so many people now really want to feel they, they can clean their product. So we, um, we sell a lot of indoor outdoor fabric. Um, Michael, how much do you, like what percentage of your business is indoor outdoor? I don't know, but it's growing. It's, it's a growing segment throughout textiles and trimming as well. We actually just announced a, a, a partnership with the perennials to do, to use their yarns because the, the technology on the yarns uh, to be able to use uh, boucles that are so soft. I, it's incredible. I mean, listen, I have five children. My wife says, why don't we have everything indoor, outdoor, indoors? We, we also know from our clients, right, that I would, I would estimate about two thirds to three quarters of all outdoor product is actually being used indoors. It's so functional. So, um, but I don't, I hope everybody out there doesn't just use indoor outdoor for everything. <laughs> terrible. Michael just said it. <laughs> That wouldn't be good. And it doesn't elevate. I mean, there's a place for everything, right? Absolutely. And um, so you talk, we've talked about these kind of new techniques, um, new materials. And Michael, is this quite a kind of important um, kind of aspect of Samuel and Sons that you think is, is important to the future? So I guess kind of incorporating these new technologies whilst also looking to your, to your heritage as well. Oh, absolutely. Um, so there, there have been so many different ways that we, we sorry, that's me. <laughs> uh, can't prepare for everything. You're in demand. <laughs> um, we're, um, we're thinking about uh, techno technologies and how they interplay with the heritage. We're also just, th there have been so many advents. I mean, this is, uh, this is Lori's uh, latest pleat, the, the Encore, the pleated collection. Here, you have the patterns actually pleated. I don't know if you could see it. Yeah. It's printed. Okay, that's not something that you've had seen in printing, uh, printing and trimming. Digital print, which is yeah. So right, it's, so it's technology. Digitally printed. Then you have then you have laser cutting 
in order to laser cut the pattern and then apply it to the ground. So, you know, I think generally speaking, people will see a product and say, wow, that's really beautiful. But, you know, some that appreciation for what's going on in terms of the technology, in right. terms of the handcraft that's involved. Yeah. Um, here's another one with laser cutting. Uh, Lori, you get, I mean, and these are both Lori's, right? So laser cutting and then it's appliqued. So you, you have a fair amount of handwork to put them on, right? Is some of the heritage. And then you yeah. have this technology, the laser cutting. So we really think that you can use technology and you could use it and you could use it to enhance a lot of the heritage processes um, right. that are happening. So the two kind of complement each other, I guess. Um, and Michael, this, the piece that you just showed us before with the digital print, can you hold it up again? Of course. And the laser cut. So tell us a little bit about that, um, how that would be made, like how many kind of different kind of people would be oh. in, involved in the process of it, just to give us a bit of an insight. So number one, you, you, you digitally print a fabric, yardage, with the pattern, that's like a watercolor. At the same time, you're, you're may having the, the tape, the ground tape made at a different place. Then once it's printed, it gets laser cut into that beautiful meander shape. And then you bring the tape to it and it gets, after it's laser, it gets applique, as Michael said, stitched on the tape ground. So there's so many steps and so many different hands that are working on it. Um, and you know what? We could emulate that in just a print. It would never be the same. Absolutely. Because we need to touch it and feel it. And the dimension of it really comes to life. And one of the things I love about dimensional trims is how light reflects on it because it's on different angles on furniture and so forth. So the more dimension to it, the better. So there's a lot of steps there. You're yeah, absolutely right. It kind of gives it that 3D element as well exactly. when you look at it. Yes. I mean, um, I'm a 3D wannabe, like I'm, I'm a textile designer, but I always envy 3D. So we try as hard as we can with the 2D to get it to be as 3D as possible. This is faux leather, by the way. This is made, that one that Michael just hung, held up is made by, um, it's laser cut faux leather layered and then applique on it on a ground. It's really chic. I call that one chic. That's very chic. And the, so the ombre technique as well, that I think we, we're going to see a few images of the curtain tie backs. And um, tell us a little bit about that and how one of those, what the process is for kind of one of those. Well, we have to sketch and design and then we'll go, like the process first is there are meeting phases with Michael. So Michael's great because he leaves me alone for the most part. <laughs> But we have these meetings like in the beginning for the concept of the collection and then we'll do sketches and ideas and present to him and then he'll give us the green light and then he'll let us go. And then we work with the mills directly and trying to or artisans and try and develop what we want and he doesn't see half of the prototypes because they're not good. We wait till we have something we really like and then we go and we show it to him. Um, so with the with the ombre tass um, holdbacks, they-, yeah, they I think, Sorry, Laura, I think we've got some images of the ombre tie backs um coming out hopefully they'll come on okay. but becky yeah there we go hello becky <laughs> so this is the um part of the same collection this we the whole collection was all about ombre as you can see we're painting and drawing in our studio we're specking yarn colors this um fringe is really fun because the color ombres and it's very playful um and with the hold back so here it's it's color is as important almost as the product how I mean, you can color. make or break it by the colors and how you color it so and, mm -hmm. and this ombre um is this um is this something that's always kind of you've, you've has inspired you and yes always in fashion in in sunsets yeah in absolutely everything. but it also is very easy for designers to use because it means you don't just have one red, but you have different shades to work with. So it's easier to complement and coordinate with the rest of the room and scheme. Different tones, yeah, that's so true. Exactly, exactly. Lori, just, I'll just add that, you know, with the ombre, it sort of fit very much. They're, they're, Lori, uh, the people that know Lori and know her designs know that she has an aesthetic. Uh, you like to call it, Lori, I think, modern romantic, which I love. 
Um, but it, it's, no, you don't love them. <laughs> I love. I like it in Europe, but in, anyway, go ahead. Uh, anyway. I'll, so, I'll be modern romantic. Oh, call, how do I stop people from calling me? Um, <laughs> um, but this, I, this um, it, it's very much, he has a very, um, this perspective is specific enough that it, to me, it's modern and it's, and it's more feminine um, and just plays, plays beautifully. And it was a, a very big part. What I wanted to add was that it was a very big part of including, of having Lori uh, join the team. And even now we have um, a tremendous design studio led by uh, Marissa Guttmacher here. And we continue to work with Lori because she has a perspective that's so different from ours. I mean, it's the way we work with other licenses as well is that they're bringing a different perspective so that when we bring to the designers, we're bringing them the multitude of different perspectives together. It could be traditional, contemporary, you know, feminine, masculine, et cetera. So. These kind of um, the themes that we see throughout the collections, for instance, the pleated and the laser cut, are these themes that kind of you don't just use them apply them to one collection they're kind of used again and ag not again and again but in different ways so Absolutely. it's not just one the one time or one collection is that is that true that's true that right? i would call them techniques that we use and intermit mix and play with throughout and then the themes are more concepts for what a collection storytelling is about so with each collection we launch, we have a story and the story doesn't get slapped on at the end. The story starts in the beginning. Then we draw, we paint, we sketch, then we make prototypes, then we like them, we color up them. And then we get final approval or eh from Michael. And then that's, that the rest is history. And um, tell us, um, this is for the two of you, tell us a little bit about, there are so many new kind of exciting techniques and materials around at the moment, what do you hope to see more of in your future collaborative collections and in, in to, what's to come? Give us a little glimpse. Well, Lori, <laughs> let, me, let me start by saying this, just referring back to the last question. I think, Lori, you were the first one to do embroidery for trimming, right. at least for Samuel and Sons, and, and it really wasn't around almost at all. This, I think, was this was first it, time. maybe for Oasis, yeah. This yeah. is maybe our first one, still, still alive and well, and and beautiful. That's lovely. And I think that you what you find is you, different crafts are going to be carried through. I mean, there's so much embroidery, not only at Samuel and Sons, really even in the market. But you know, so so something like that is much more prevalent, and and maybe even a um, something something that you know Lori's working on for. <laughs> next collection a little hint there but um whereas pleading might be more specific right and Lori's um for us has been the only one to work with pleading so you'll you'll see depending on the technique depending on the material it may get more widely used um or it may be more specific to just a one-time type of thing but we always want to push the envelope and um because we have to stay ahead. Because even though we're the first to do things, then lots of other people follow. So it gets harder and harder, but we keep trying. And as we try to mix old and new, which I guess in a way is the theme, we keep coming up with new approaches. And um, so hopefully we surprise people and delight people You know, each time we come up with something new. We don't want to ever be boring and, and repeat ourselves. Oh, I don't think Samuel Sands will ever be considered boring or repetitive. Um, and Laurie, tell, tell us a little bit about how you find inspiration as well, because you say that each collection starts with a story and mm -hmm. then you draw. So does it come from travel or, um, yeah, how do, you, how do you find it? It comes obviously from everything. Like people always ask me where you find your inspiration and I'm like, it's from everything, but that's not really a good answer. So I will tell you that, um, of course, travel and of course, walking and nature and all kinds of things. But... I would say one that's top of the list is jewelry. I'm very, right. yeah. because I see this as jewelry for the home, I'm very inspired by actual jewelry and not just the, the history of jewelry, the techniques used over periods of time, everything from enameling to inlaying to the sh shades of gold. For example, 10 karat gold to me is just as beautiful, if not more than 24 karat gold. And how can we replicate those metallic colors 
in, in trim. And so I will say that's one of the big ones for me is how is jewelry and everything about jewelry um, has definitely in, inferred a lot of these inspirations. And then there's dimension and ceramics is a go-to for me. Um, I'm very inspired by the techniques. The Again, it's not just the dimension, but it's also the firing and the way the color looks after it's fired, the shapes, um, porcelain, and how it's sort of translucent and opaque at the same time. Yeah. So those are the kinds of things that inspire me. And um, I think we've got some images of the jewelry of some of the beading in some of the collections coming up as well. Um, there you go. It is, as you say, really um, jewelry for the home. It's so yeah. beautiful and unique and it's such a good way of expressing it too. And the other thing I love is, is how designers are using it in ways I would never have thought, like lampshade, you know, decorate. Like there are ways that people are using it that are, um, someone sent me an image the other day of it lining up on the wainscoting in a wall and it looks so beautiful. Um, so it's kind of fun to see what people do with it. And would you say that now kind of um, that designers are finding, um, as you say, they're having more kind of a bit more fun with trim. It's a bit more playful. It's a bit more accessible as well than maybe it was years ago. I don't know, Michael, what do you think? Well, I hope we're making it um, more prevalent today. Um, it, there, there's an opportunity for sure. Um, like we're talking about how it's more contemporary. There's a lot of things that are playful. I think also that designers have um, recognized more in more numbers that the details make such a difference in terms of creating luxury and completing a room. Um, as these days, I'm not sure as much in the UK, but I could tell you in the US that you have a lot more finished product that's more sophisticated. And right. Interior designers um, are using their expertise, uh, they're using trimming, and they're using other details to create a complete home, to, to make it more luxurious, to make it more comfortable, to bring more dimension, more layers. Um, and you can do it, Sophie, like you said, you could do it to be playful. Uh, a pom-pom fringe is a great way to bring color into a room. Um, and then you can take a border and you can just finish a, a, a leading edge as well. So there's so many different ways, a contrast yeah. piping, like a leather piping or something like that. So uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity. I think that um, there are times that some designers haven't used passementry and they're somewhat intimidated by it. So I, I think what has happened really more than anything is there are more resources out there. There's more trimming out there so that you can get more comfortable with trying to use it. I always encourage um, designers who haven't used trim. A lot, of, a lot of times we'll hear, I'll hear especially that, um, yeah, well, you know, I don't, I don't really use trim. And, uh, you know, I don't have a traditional uh, design. Uh, I, I'm not a traditional designer. I said, well, have you come in? Have you seen the leather piping? Have you seen the simple borders? Have, why don't you try by putting a piping on a chair that has a contrast or a leather or a tape or one of Lori's, you know, beautiful embroidered tapes. I mean, there's so many different opportunities. So, um, and then there's other things that we're doing at Samuel and Sons where we have a tailor-made series, which teaches a uh, workroom, some of the um, tricks of the trade in terms of how to uh, apply it and we're using social media to show a lot of inspiration in terms of the products and how they use so um, <coughs> I just think it's it's um, there's, maybe uh, there's an opportunity for clients who are not familiar with using trim to dip their feet in a little bit and and really enjoy the benefits of it yeah and I guess as, as you say kind of each design that you have because you have so many d diverse ones can bring something different to a room. So it can be playful, it can be sophisticated, it can be kind of crafty, which is a wonderful thing. And so I guess it's kind of changing a mindset too, maybe for some people. It's exactly, that's exactly, uh, that's perfect. Well said, changing a mindset. Um, well guys, Lori, just... Lori, Lori's been pushing that big. She says, my clients, they, they don't know trim. They don't, they, they haven't walked into your showroom, right? They, they just don't think to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so, they must yeah. be very inspired when they come into eat any of your showrooms because everything is just so, it's like a treasure trove of 
trinkets. It's just everything so tactile. You just and the color as well. It's just yeah, it's wonderful. Hit in a candy shop when you go, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I just want to say, I just wanted to just add one thing, which is to say that I am very, I work with a lot of clients and um, doing licenses and um, Michael knows this and I don't want to make this any kind of love fest because we certainly have our arguments, um, but he's an absolute pleasure to work with because he's so open and willing to push the envelope and, and have discussions. It's not just yes or no, nothing is ever black and white and it's very appreciated. And I think because of that mentality that he has, the company is as successful as it is. So yeah, that makes sense. That makes Thank sense. you, Lori. Well, Lori has taught me quite a bit through the years in, in terms of design and appreciation. And I will say, Lori, I, I, this has nothing to do with trimming, but I always say that Lori has taught me that you do business with people you like. You know, and a good point. I I love working with you, Lori, and it's um, oh. it's that's why we work every year, right? We're doing something else. So very nice. Yes. Um, well, that um, brings us to the end of our discussion. So I just want to thank you guys so much for um, for taking part. It's been really interesting. I'm sure everyone's enjoyed it, and thank you to the Harbour for hosting as well. And guys, I hope we'll see each other on the same same soil. It's some point. Let's see. So thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Michael, and thank, thank you, Laurie. Thank you, Sophie, and I love your magazine so much. So thank you. you. Bye.